with dear alums of Shriram College of Commerce, illustrious alums, wonderful human beings, and my very dear students. If I speak about the domain in which uh, both Ms. Tanya and uh, Mr. Ashwajit will be talking about, it is a development sector approach. And often people think that an MBA would be joining a corporate sector. So what is the role of an MBA in a development sector job opportunity? I think the kind of the pandemic which has struck the current generation, especially I'm talking about my existing batch of students, now know how important the development part of growth is. The moment you leave the development part and just concentrate on the growth, which is all about money, things could go wrong, whether it is uh, going wrong in terms of distribution of income and wealth, whether it is in terms of facilities of health, whether it is in any form of other inequalities, may be it gender inequalities, we would lose out on all this. And ultimately, we will never be able to attain a growth which is sustainable and inclusive. So the moment you bring into aspects such as sustainability and inclusive development in your overall GDP growth angle, that is where we must focus also on what would be the development strategies and what are the kind of organizations which would like to have students with a background in aspects which are more related to development. Even at the international level, you all do aspire to join organizations such as the World Bank or maybe the United Nations, whether it is the FAO or whether it is EFAD. All these are working in the area of development, uh, solid waste management, urbanization, gender. I think Tanya would love to hear your views on how you've been handling because the kind of preference for a meta sun in India is so very high that there are ample number of missing girls all across. Uh, I think with this, I would, uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to listening the speakers of the day and would uh, welcome uh, your own experiences is in this domain. And to the extent you are able to enlighten our students, how these jobs are there, not just at the grassroots, which are the NGOs, or, but also as, at a very big national or an international platform. Thank you so much once again, Ms. Tanya and Mr. Ashwaji for being with us today, sparing your valuable time. And must say, I'm eagerly looking forward to being with you throughout the webinar. Thank you so much once again. So the so thing thing. Thing. Yeah, you want me to start? Yeah. Yes. yes uh, perfect. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simrit Kaur, uh, uh, for for these kind words, and of course the the moderators as well for the kind words. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Rina Chadha, Professor Rina Chadha, for for helping put this together. Uh, first of all, let me uh, tell you, I'm both Tanya and I extremely pleased uh, to be here for this webinar, and I understand it's the first of the series. Uh, because for us, uh, I mean, development sector, of course, is is a passion and something we are very, uh, which is close to our heart. But probably equally close is our association with uh, Shriram College of Commerce because uh, we are both from there, and that's where we actually uh, met as well. So for for us, it's a journey back home in in some ways, and I'm extremely pleased. We are both extremely pleased to be here. Uh, in fact, there is no better time to talk about the development sector because, as uh, 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 Dr. Gaur rightly mentioned, uh, right now, if there is any sector that is still uh, facing the challenge of, of coronavirus, facing the economic challenges, facing the issues around migrant labor, looking at issues around unemployment, they're all related to the development sector. In fact, if you let me, let me tell you, the development sector is such a vast sector that if you were to pick up any newspaper on any day of the of, 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 of the week, probably you will get the maximum number of articles on the development sector. You will not get as many articles on, on industry. You won't get as many articles on, on uh, FMCG. You won't get articles on mergers and acquisitions. But you, I mean, every, every article, everything around us uh, pertains to or has some impact or relevance to the development sector. I'd also like to congratulate all of you for this course that you're doing and as well as for the fact that you are all studying at SRCC, which continues to be the number one college in its, its area. And, and, and I have to say that, that I 
cannot think of any institution anywhere in the world which has maintained its rank of number one over the years. You see, it's 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 once in a while people do manage to get to the number one position, but to be able to maintain that position, and it used to be number one when we were there, uh, uh, you know, 30 plus years ago, and it, it continues to be number one. So I think there is there is something special about the the education, the infrastructure, the upgradation, and 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 you guys are fortunate to uh, all of you are fortunate to be. Uh, part of uh, uh, SRCC, and I wish you all the best. Uh, perhaps when I think back, one of my first uh, uh, exposures to the development sector, or what gave me satisfaction, was actually at 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 Shridhar College. When I when I think back, because we had a very similar strike to the strike that you got uh, to the situation you got right now. We had a strike, of course. You got a, a lockdown and work from home uh, situation. We actually uh, had a 107 day strike when I when when I was in final year. I was the president of the students' union that time in SRCC, and uh, we had a huge challenge because we had to organize crossroads in that in that uh, you know in that uh, during the lockdown because otherwise we would get run into the exams and we won't be able to do that. And we we took it up as a challenge. We did a lot of thinking. We went out of our way, thought of innovative ways to attract colleges. We, we had a strike, and during the strike, we had a, 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 a organized crossroad. How we were able to get people? We we strategized. We we thought of new ways, including getting uh, you know uh, Gulam Ali to to sort of uh, launch the the event, and then then actually going and 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 getting uh, uh, people from. Uh, GMC and LSR and making sure because they were coming in the whole sort of university blocked at Sri Raman and, and things like that. And we were able to raise a fair amount of funds. At the end of the day, while we enjoyed ourselves, it gave us a lot of pleasure to be able to organize cross swords with whatever surplus money we had left. I remember we took the call that we will end up buying blankets and, and shoes for all the class board employees. And also television for them, where they, they had a common area to sit. Uh, so we did that, and I'm talking about 37 years ago. And at the end of the day, I think while we all enjoyed Crossroad, we all enjoyed the, the, the fun and, and games in Crossroad, but what gave us a lot of satisfaction was the smiles on the face of, of these, uh, you know, class four employees of the college, including, I remember there was a cobbler called Ram Babu who used to be sitting actually inside the college. And he couldn't believe it because he's not even a regular staff of the college. And, and that kind of satisfaction, I, I can still sort of, when I recount some of my favorite uh, uh, instances at SRCC, that's definitely one of them. After that, I, I didn't really get into the development sector, became a chartered accountant, company secretary, then went on the ILAC scholarship to the London School of Economics, actually came back and uh, set up a financial services company. We took it public. Two of our companies were listed. So at the age of early 30s, I was I was the founder of two public listed companies. I'm talking about early 90s. And towards the end of 90s, in 98, 99, I remember we were we were sitting in an alumni function of the London School of Economics, and uh, talking about what is the real need for for this for the country. And we realized that while we make very good policies in, in India, there is this huge gap about the implementation of the policies because policy, the policy makers are often disconnected to the implementation and the people who are working at the implementation level are often disconnected with what's happening at the policy level. So just with that small thought in mind, uh, along with a few other alumni of the London School of Economics, I founded the uh, IP Global in December 1998. Uh, and, and the rest is history, as I would like to say, because I started enjoying the sector so much. It gave me so much satisfaction. We made it very clear from day one that we will make it a for profit organization because we don't want to run it as an NGO because you will always be dependent on grants and funds, but we will run it as a sustainable for profit organization where we will invest back the, the earnings that we have uh, to a large extent back into the the company to try and expand and sustain the business. And that is the reason why today, even in the, the height of uh, uh, COVID, we've not really retrenched people. We have not cut salaries of people. And we are perhaps the only uh, uh, firm which is still hiring. In fact, uh, we, we are getting about uh, six people from SRCC joining us right out of the exams as regular employees. In fact, two of them came back to us because the offers they'd got had actually uh, been withdrawn. And we're taking six interns as well. So this is a sector where we get a lot of satisfaction. 
uh, and, and it's been a long journey, but a very interesting journey. My, uh, so I'm going to be talking today about the development sector, what it really entails, uh, what are the areas that are covered in the development sector, and then Tanya would probably uh, talk a bit about, maybe in uh, five, 10 minutes, talk a bit about IP. So IP Global, as I already mentioned, was founded in 1998, uh, and, and we are basically a company that's working in the entire range of uh, development sector. Let me tell you my strong connection with SRCC is, that I just said is not because of this lecture that I'm trying to say that, but I'm still very much in touch with my colleagues from SRCC. We have a group called Crossroads 83, and to let you know, this is my group called Crossroads 83, where they're all identically dressed. Talking about my strong connection with SRCC, that's my, my group of SRCC friends who are all identically dressed for my son's wedding two years ago. So that's my, and we call our group Crossroads 83. Okay, let me start by the impact maker. I want to start by giving you the example of two people. Can you recognize these two people? I'm sure most of you know the guy on the left. Few of you might know the guy on the right as well. They both co-founded Microsoft in, in 1975. Yeah, so the first person formed the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2000, Bill Gates, and focused on healthcare, reduction of poverty, and donated 36 billion uh, to the foundation impacts billions of people today. The person on the right was his partner, Paul Allen. He was also a billionaire, 44 billion. The only difference is he contributed 2 billion into, into philanthropy and ended up uh, also investing in AI. But today, while both of them discontinued from the board in 2000, we all know Bill Gates as the person who is a philanthropist, the person who's giving back to society. So what the point I'm trying to make here is that it is important if you want to be known, if you want to be in the sector, important to be giving back to society as well. Nearer home, if we were to look at the first person joined the family business in '63. The revenue went up 40 times, profit over 50 times, built one of the most trusted brands in India. 66% of the group's holdings is in the name of the trust and is plowed back into the, the philanthropic activities. A person who's built credibility, who's built reputation. Second person I'm talking about also inherited a family business, put into a multinational company. The turnover went up many times expanded into liquor business, eventually was one point, started selling companies and ran from India. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. The point again I'm trying to make is that for people to build a long lasting legacy, it is important not only to, to earn money, not only to look at, at, at generating wealth, that's important, yes, but at the end of the day, at some stage, one needs to start giving back to society as well, if you want to make a name for yourself, if you want to build a legacy. Near our home, look at Sriram College of Commerce, started by the DCM group, which was one of the top 10 business houses. But today, it's probably better known because of Lady Sriram College as well as Sriram College of Commerce. I want to start by giving you a little bit details of a project which made a huge impact, a project that we did before I move into the actual development sector. So you get a flavor of the kind of work that is done in the development sector. This is the Odisha Girls Incentive Program, which was done, funded by DFID, which we had done. It was a five years program. It was to encourage scheduled caste boys and girls to continue their education uh, in the secondary school because uh, all studies had shown that actually there is a huge dropout after class eights because boys start working, they start earning a livelihood, girls get married or they attain puberty, it's not safe for them to go to school. So this was a scholarship where a monthly scholarship was given by the UK government along with the government of Orissa and we were the technical advisors for this entire uh, scholarship. 
we actually covered 12 lakh boys and girls from the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. And at the end of the scholarship, we opened bank accounts for them. We enabled IT based uh, solutions for them. We went and counseled their parents so that they can go and uh, continue school. We created learning hubs. We created safe transport. All this was part of the development process that was uh, there in the program. And if you look at the impact, it is very satisfying. We ended up empowering 12 lakh boys and girls. Financial empowerment is if you open a bank account and you start operating it. Can you imagine the amount of empowerment 12 lakh students got by opening a bank account and actually seeing about 250 rupees transferred every month into their bank account? There was an overall increase in enrollment. Uh, there was an overall increase in the attendance levels and studies showed that around out of the 12 lakh uh, students, they were at least three and a half lakh students who would have normally dropped out of, of uh, education in class 9th and 10th who continued and completed their education because of this initiative. So that's the kind of sheer impact that programs in this sector make. That just a just a little bit of a flavor of what is the kind of work that is there in this sector because it's a very broad term when we talk about the development sector. I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the development sector. It's a sector which really looks at improving the country's economic and social conditions. Now, what do we really mean by that? It's, it's all encompassing. It covers all issues relating to human empowerment, anti-poverty, economic development, health, education, sustainability. And, and it's important to have a sustainable development because as you're aware, India's got the largest number of uh, people living below poverty line in the world. We, we are close to about 40% of the world's poor people actually live in India. We were doing reasonably well as far as, 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 as getting out of this vicious circle of illiteracy, overpopulation and poverty was concerned. But COVID has actually put us back years now and, and it is expected that nearly about anything between 300 million to 400 million uh, people will get back below the poverty line by the time COVID gets over. Uh, development uh, is all about looking at growth, looking at progress and looking at a positive change. But at the end of the day, what is the positive change that we are looking at? We are wanting an improved quality of life. We're looking at creating and expanding uh, local income. Uh, livelihoods is extremely important because we can continue to pump in money in the development sector. But at the end of the day, unless we we have avenues for economic and, and livelihood. It's not going to be a sustainable model. Giving grants or giving giving uh, food is, is a one time exercise, but giving them an opportunity to earn and create jobs is a much bigger challenge that needs to be addressed. 10% uh, of India's uh, rich actually control 77% of the national wealth. Uh, Sustainable development really covers this whole range of, of social, sustainable, economic environment, and, and there are measures that or indicators that help measure the development. Now, when you talk about economic development, you're looking at the GDP, the per capita, GNP per head. When you talk about social, you're looking at mortality rate, the death rates, infant rates, uh, infant mortality, the education. Uh, so the sustainable development go goals are, are uh, 17 goals that were signed up by the UN General Assembly in, in 2015 in New York. And these 17 goals are, are really across uh, social, economic, environment, and peace and partnership. These goals are, are, are something that, that the UN uh, General Assembly has signed up and the members have signed up to try and make the world a better place to live in. Uh, it's very interesting earlier till 2015 you actually had the millennium development goals which actually aimed at reducing poverty uh, reducing hunger improving the health standards improving education and a fair amount of those goals were actually achieved till 2015 but this time around the 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 uh, partner countries in the un they decided to be more ambitious and they said that by 2030 we would like a world where there is no poverty, that's the goal number one, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable energy, economic growth, industry inequalities, sustainable cities, uh, climate action, life below water. 
and peace and justice. So these are these are the goals that they actually agreed. There are a number of indicators against each of these goals. How will they measure the success? And each country had in turn got its own sub goals and, and objectives. And believe me that every country was working very, very earnestly towards these. And in most of these uh, areas, uh, most countries, including India on most parameters was doing extremely well. And we were hoping that by 2030, even if all the goals had not been achieved, uh, many of the goals would have been achieved. However, there's been a huge setback because of COVID, and 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 I fear that the situation by the end of COVID could be uh, worse, if not as bad as as uh, 2015. We've actually gone back in the global development and 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 uh, social equity by maybe about seven to ten years by the end of COVID. Uh, so these are things that happen. Probably we will need to reinforce and come back and and look at uh, looking at the development sector goals again. Uh, nearer home in India, India. Let me start by saying that India today is one of the pioneers in the developing world. When we talk about the development sector or success stories uh, for the rest of the world. India is always uh, considered one of the pioneers in the sector. India is one of the countries which has done extremely well in most areas. Uh, this is just a list of some of the, the government of India schemes uh, and, and also the, uh, the, uh, the institutions that manage these schemes on the left side. And let me tell you, when it comes to social sector schemes, India designs some of the best schemes. Our biggest challenge is in the implementation of the schemes. Uh, it's been rightly said that uh, a, a brilliant policy, if it is poorly implemented, is of no use. A mediocre policy, even if it's well implemented, is far better than the brilliant policy which is implemented. So I think India has this challenge of implementation. We have a number of uh, challenges across regulatory issues along, along so many institutions that have been created. Then, of course, we have a very complex governance structure of the center, state, and local government. They all have to work uh, on, on, on various aspects. But having said that, uh, India should be uh, proud that we today have the best employment guarantee scheme in the world. Narega is, is, is a pioneer. Every developing country in the world looks up to Narega. Uh, uh, our Anganwadi and self-help groups, the women empowerment models that India has got, especially Kerala, are, are, are extremely good, extremely positive, where they get the women in the forefront, and these are models which are being uh, disseminated and, and followed rest in the rest of the world. And then, of course, the the Ayushman Bharat, the, the, the mass insurance scheme that we, we launched just recently a few years ago, that again is something which is uh, the largest uh, uh, mass insurance scheme in the world, and the NHA is effectively, uh, the National Health Authority is effectively running that. So this is just a flavor of the kind of schemes that are covered in the, in the uh, development sector in India. The, the key stakeholders, now let me tell you, when you talk about development sector, uh, the first, of course, is the international aid agencies. Here, I'd like to mention again that uh, the, the major developed countries have signed up to the ODA, which is really the, the uh, uh, overseas uh, development aid that is uh, given, uh, the official development assistance, sorry, the official development assistance that they all sign up, have signed up to, where they've signed up to uh, committing 0.7% of their uh, uh, GNI towards giving aid to developing countries and trying to uh, make sure that the, uh, the, the sustainable development goals are achieved. So this is the aid that every country, every development country actually gives from its budget and they've all signed up to that. Uh, so when you, when you see the US aid working in India or when you see the UK aid or DFID working here or you see the, uh, the JICA working here, uh, they are committed to work in the developing countries to try and 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 make this a better place, a better world for us to to live in. Uh, in India, India uh, receives about two and a half billion of ODA in in 2018. But if you if you look at globally, USA is the largest uh, uh, donor of ODA. The maximum amount of money goes to Africa. Of course, Africa gets total aid of about 28 billion dollars uh, annually. After US, you've got UK, you've got Germany, you've got uh, Japan. And uh, just to let you know, India has also signed up and India has also now started uh, uh, an aid agency which rests under the Ministry of External Affairs called the Development Partners uh, uh, DPA. So 
So India also started now uh, funding and supporting uh, some of the neighboring countries uh, like like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, as well as uh, doing a fair amount of work in Africa. Even though India is also a large discipline, India is, is, is giving funding to some of these countries. So this is the, the, the bigger, the biggest player or the biggest amount of funding in the development sector comes from the international aid agency. In addition, of course, to the, the, the national governments themselves give a fair amount of money. The next, of course, is the CSR space. All of you are aware 2% of the, the company's profits are to be marked for corporate social responsibility. Unfortunately, most of the Indian companies are not following that because while the government has put that in, 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 in law, it is not mandatory and it's not enforceable. But having said that, we still have some very responsible corporates like Tata's, Heroes, ITC, Infosys, Maruti, who are putting in funding in this. Uh, we will find globally, in fact, that there are a number of foundations and philanthropic agencies which uh, put in a lot of money, and that is where India still lacks much behind the others. Uh, besides BMGF, which is the largest uh, funder, you've got the Child uh, Children's Investment Fund in UK, the Rockefeller Foundation, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So a lot of money comes in into the development sector from these foundations. India has started, but started small. We've got some likes of Tata, Asim Premji, HCL, etc. But India still has a lot to do. So these are, these are the areas where you will actually find a lot of funding coming in. Now, coming specifically to the job opportunities or the career opportunities, uh, when we talk, I, I've just got a couple of slides on that. Uh, and, and as ma'am initially mentioned, it's a huge sector. What is the kind of people that the sector is looking at? Is looking at, at people who are looking at a, a meaningful and satisfying financial sustainable career. Today, the sector pays reasonably all right. It may not pay you as much as the investment banks and 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 uh, uh, some of the the M and A or, or or the the strategy consulting companies. But but the sectors come a long way. It it pays a reasonable amount today. It helps you improve the 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 lives of the underserved and underprivileged, and it it gives you that kind of satisfaction of giving back to society. Like any other sector, the development sector requires people with multiple skills and aspirations to play multiple roles. In fact, if you really want to get an all-rounded development, this is the sector for you. And I can vouch a number of you will get offers from accounting firms or from, from uh, including the big four, where you will end up doing very clerical job in, 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 in a number of years. You'll probably be working for an international team or something. But, but if you're looking at a very satisfying career, which helps you, uh, uh, you know, get multidisciplinary uh, expertise as well as work across sector, get, get satisfaction. This is a sector to be working in. You need to get into the sector if you like interacting with people, because this is all about being people centric and, and working with people. You need to have immense patience in this sector. Nothing happens in this sector overnight. It's a long process where you need to build the ownership. You need to look at working together with the government, with the donors, with the, the, the stakeholders. You have to carry the stakeholders because this is all about change. It is all about behavior change, economic change, and change cannot happen uh, without carrying people with you. So it's a very intricate and complex sector, and it can be quite, quite challenging and interesting. You need to have patience. You need to have the, the ability to think of outside the box. You cannot just uh, you know, what works in one state or one country does not necessarily work in the other country. Each country, each state has its own challenges. So you need to be able to adapt and think of the box, out of the box and, and look at solving complex issues. This is my last slide uh, 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 on, on this. What are the kind of career options that you can have in this sector? The first, of course, is working with government agencies. You could work as a young professional with the Niti Aayog. You could work as a consultant with a government agency. You could even join the government. You could even now, in fact, the government has started looking at lateral entries. You could look at lateral entries as well. Uh, you could, of course, work for donors, uh, the ADB, World Bank, USAID, UN agencies. They normally do not take pressures, but they do have a young professional program, which would require you to in all probability to do a PhD before you can really be eligible. I think if I'm not wrong, some of the, the young professional programs uh, uh, allow you to be up to 32 years before you join them, but they do prefer uh, PhDs. Uh, so you will need to study more if you want to directly join a donor. 
you could join an advisory or consulting firm. Uh, all of them actually do some bits or pieces. We, we are, of course, totally IP is totally development sector focused. We only work in this sector, uh, but even the big fours have have uh, divisions of the development sector. Uh, they have a, there are a number of sector specific companies also, you know, uh, they will be companies working in the health space. There'll be co companies working in the education space, uh, but IP, for instance, does work across sectors, but you would have sector specialist uh, firms as well. You'll have a number of NGOs and foundations. If you want to, if you enjoy working at the ground level, you can work at the ground level. You can actually go into the field uh, with foundations or, or NGOs like uh, uh, CARE or some of the others, or even work in, in policy for Tata and BMGF. You could even work for technology firms, firms which actually come up with solutions in the health sector. Today, we've got COVID around us. There are a lot of technology firms which are working in developing, uh, you know, uh, uh, PPEs, developing vaccines, developing, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 testing equipment, etc. Those are those are also options if you want to work in the uh, uh, impact sector. And then, of course, you could work for impact funds or innovative financing. In fact, currently, uh, one of our programs Pehle, is actually working with the National Health Authority, which runs the Ayushman Bharat, and we are actually trying to raise hundred million uh, uh, dollars of innovative financing to be able to look at COVID uh, innovations as well as other communicable diseases because COVID is not the end of it. We are expecting a second wave as well as maybe in times to come other communicable diseases. So we're looking at actually uh, provide uh, raising money and then providing uh, uh, grant loans and equity uh, to, to companies that uh, work in, in this space and, and come up with innovation. Uh, there are also this whole uh, range of impact funds that 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 are uh, coming up right now, as well as you've got these impact bonds. Again, we are doing an impact bond in Madhya Pradesh for tuberculosis because most of the funding agencies today are not looking at processes; they are looking at results. So this is a, another mechanism of of payment by results. Now, what is the kind of role you could really be looking at? You could look at policy development. You could be looking at grassroots implementation. You could be working at uh, program uh, uh, reforms. Monitoring and evaluation, partnership, grant and fund management, and of course product development. So there is this huge career waiting for you in the the the, the uh, development sector. A career where you would, at the end of the day, you would be a pebble in a pond that makes ripples and creates changes. It's not about how much money that you want in the sector, but about how you can really contribute in this sector. Let me also again tell you, it's never too late to get into this sector. Uh, I, for one, got into this sector maybe 12 or 13 years after I started my professional career. You don't really need a formal training to get into the sector. Again, I'm an example of somebody who never really went in and did a development studies course or went in and did, did anything on, 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 on uh, any of these areas. But, but you need to have the passion, you need to have the motivation, the innovation, and the drive to make change happen. The sector is waiting for you. It's a huge sector. It's a sector which is all encompassing and, and you will see lots more of this sector. And, and, and I welcome any questions after this. I'm just going to hand over to Tanya now. who will talk a bit about IP and tell you the kind of uh, uh, work that one's doing there. Tanya, over to you. Yeah, yeah good evening, all of you. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview on the IP Global. So we can start, I can start now. Uh, we were founded in 1998 by alumni of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and of course, the prestigious alumnus of Shriram College of Commerce. We are proud to add that we are the largest multi-sectoral development sector consulting company in South Asia, partnering with the big four and MBBs and other multinational companies and competing with them as well. We have completed 21 years in 2020, completing 1,100 projects in 100 countries. And we did a research and analysis on how many people we've actually impacted by these projects. And we reached a figure which was over 350 million people. We have a workforce of 1,000 and consultants of over 1,500. They include specialists in the development sector, urban planners, architects, doctors, and other highly qualified professionals. With great pride, we have recruited five students 
from our alma mater and six interns who would join post the exams. Now we'll have a look at our growth story, which is over 21 years. We were founded by the alumnus in 1998 of the LSE. In 2004, we won our first international assignment in Sri Lanka, which was awarded by the Asian Development Bank. In 2011, Henderson Equity Partners invested in IP Global and we opened offices in Kenya and Ethiopia. In 2014, IPE acquired a UK-based development company, Triple Line, and expanded professionals beyond 800 people. In 2018, IP established offices in Nepal, Myanmar, and the Philippines. In 2020, we complete 21 years of transforming lives. We have now also added to our website a microsite on COVID-19, which includes various uh, interventions in our various projects towards COVID-19. One of the prestigious ones is a technical collaboration between USAID, NHA, where IP and IP to generate funds to leverage and support healthcare infrastructure in India to combat COVID-19 and also future healthcare concerns in India. As you see, we are multi-sectoral in our areas of work, and this distinguishes us from the big four and other multinational and the MBBs of the world. We have 12 major sectors and practices out of which EPFM, which is the economic and public financial management, social and economic empowerment, tourism and heritage and conservation, education and skills development, health, nutrition and wash are the major areas where we actually function. This shows our global presence, which you can see which is India, which is our headquarters, the UK, Kenya, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Philippines, Myanmar, Nepal, and then we have the local offices as well, which are listed. So that's the last slide we've got. True, true belief cases. that we believe in. We believe, we truly believe in this, which says when God blesses you financially, don't raise your standard of living. Raise your standard of giving. And we truly believe in this. And I feel all of us should actually follow this. Thank you. So we can ask. Uh, I think that concludes. I think we've uh, run over a bit because I think a little bit of confusion in getting started, but uh, we're, we're happy to uh, answer any questions now. Uh, I would request Pranav to uh, ask the first question. Okay, sir. So, uh, I have the first question up. So, how does a career in this sector make us move out of our comfort zone? Make you move out of you. Yeah. Okay. To start with, if you if you really okay, the, the background that you have here is pure. Right now, whatever we've learned is theory in 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 commerce and and uh, economics and the management as well. Uh, now, the number of ways you'll move out of your comfort zone. First of all, I would always recommend that even if you're working for a donor or the government or anybody, unless you spend a couple of months on the field, you will never really know what's happening. And believe me, we do not appreciate how fortunate we are because when you go to the field, you really understand where the real challenges and issues in rural India, rural parts. Uh, and it's not. It's I can I can challenge. It's not to be easy for you to really uh, go and uh, uh, stay there because that's when you're going to be moving out of your comfort zone. Let me tell you. In one of my early days, I actually visited a huge mill uh, outside Calcutta, where there was this whole load of people in slums who were living there, who used to actually be uh, bathing and cooking their food with the. The dirty jute water, which was in the uh, either the backyards of the jute uh, well. Can you imagine that is the kind of drinking water they had? That is the kind of bathing water they had. 
and 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 i think if i had not visited that 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 that, that slum i would never have got an idea sitting in my comfort zone of, of the impact and the need to really do something in this sector you will also get an opportunity to 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 visit other states other countries as well in this sector so it's it's i think an ideal sector to really move out of your comfort zone thank you sir uh, thank you pranav uh, so the second question is uh, how is the work culture and requirement different from those required from fields like core finance or consultancy oh it's 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 very different uh, i mean this is all about people this is all about uh, uh, you know interacting with stakeholders caring people having the passion to really go beyond your 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 uh, jd in fact if you have to you know uh, go that extra mile to 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 make things happen you need to do that it's a very informal sector you have to uh talk to people and interact with them as one of them i i, I remember it's a good question you asked because when i moved from financial services to to development sector in my very first uh, meeting that i had i was all suited and tie and i was going in and i was i was ticked off by somebody from the us said that this is not how you uh, you know uh, dress up in this sector this is a informal and a casual sector you will put off people by coming in dressed as 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 you know uh, somebody very very formal because you have to work with people it's all about working with people so it's it's very different and the work culture let me tell you is very open there are no there 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 are very little uh, uh, hierarchies here uh, it's an open culture uh, in, in Uh, in in all all the development sector uh, uh, companies uh, there is more of in, engagement with each other there is more of consensus building it's not autocratic it even if even if, if i as a managing director have a view you, you know you should see some of our meetings every single person has his right to be able to air his view because we're all talking about how do we get change uh, how do we make change happen everybody's got their views so it's a very equal set to work in thank you sir uh, over to you tanav uh, so sir is there any diversity in the roles offered within the development sector yes there are i i i i mentioned to you uh, in my last slide that you could you know actually work in any of the sectors that you like with some, some of you may, might have an interest in the water and sanitation you could work in that sector you could build a career in that sector Uh, you could work in the health sector you could work in uh, some of you might want to work in decentralization all about governance and accountability and transparency some of you might want to work in the, the gender and women empowerment space so there is there are various sectors that you could work in and within the sectors again you could either be working in in policy you could either be working in in uh, actually the grassroots level implementation of 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 some of those policies you could even be uh, taking on the role of monitoring of programs or program management so you know it, it if you're fortunate you'll be able to actually get some exposure on on each of these aspects then there's another interesting aspect of actually getting involved in writing proposals for bids because when you're writing proposals you do a huge amount of research you actually look at the best practices the best models and then you're able to write a proposal so there is a fair amount of thinking policy making and you have to really be a thinker so if you if you're somebody who's wanting to who's got ideas of of where they want to see them and and test them on the field this is the sector to be in thank you sir next question uh, amit uh, so the fourth question is with the rapid emergence of tech enabled startups in india iot and digitization becoming the new normal and we see a startup era emerging so since there are many startups who use tech and other innovative means to make our lives sustainable and cities smart where do you uh, find them where do they find themselves positioned in the development sector so uh, see they have a definitely a place in the in the sector like all other sectors uh, you know uh, one one would definitely welcome uh, technology in this space but remember this this sector is is not only about technology but also about being able to build the capacity to execute or implement the technology remember at the end of the day 
a huge component of this sector is all about capacity building of the of the uh, local people of the 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 uh, people in rural parts of india people who are not affluent so you you can't just introduce a technology you know you, you keep talking about technology around um, you know uh, waste to energy or segregation of waste and recycling of waste but unless you also uh, create that that capacity building of being able to execute that the technology will fail you have you have a technology uh, there are a lot of technology that's being welcomed right now on on uh, uh, you know uh, saving energy looking at uh, 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 a clean environment purifying the the air looking at uh, uh, reducing the carbon emissions looking at uh, at also uh, uh, reducing the energy uh, leakages in water etc but these technologies are all welcome but at the end of the day if you want a startup to really scale up you need to work in the development sector otherwise you can never get the numbers and for them to scale up you need to also work parallelly with 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 people to be able to accept this technology so there is a to answer your question there is a space yes for technology but uh, but but the challenge here is how do you introduce the technology and that is where the development sector uh, professionals really come in play thank you sir succinctly answers the question uh, pranav this would be the last question please yeah. uh, so sir uh, with the global pandemic the covid 19 the development sector especially the non profits have strived hard to ensure that every indian is protected but they are facing an existential crisis since csr funding on which they depend will sharply decline now even personal donors will decrease them uh, like having contributed already to pmks fund or covid relief funds so this will lead to ngos facing job cuts expenditure cuts and lack of finance so i would love to know your views on this and how if possible can we mitigate the impact the first thing is yes there would be probably a, a reduction in uh, budgets as far as oda is concerned because of two reasons the first as i mentioned the oda is 0.7% of uh, the the uh, gni of of uh, those countries and most countries are really actually going to see a negative uh, growth this year so the 0.7% to start with is going to be lower than what it was last year and a number of countries will perhaps also i fear not honor their commitment that they've signed up to because those countries will start with with a lot of country looking inwards those countries will start probably looking at their own challenges and issues first because a lot of their own people have got affected by 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 covid so there is going to be a challenge on funding but at the other end if you look at uh, 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 our own government you will realize that uh, even in the in the packages that have been announced till now most of the packages announced have besides of course some of the ones for business but most of the packages that we announced around the the development sector itself be it be it you know the the the, the kisan rozgar yojana be it the the uh, uh, you know uh, increase of narega be it the 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 uh, migrant labor scheme so there will be a huge amount of work coming in here and at the end of the day this sector has always had its share of of funding uh, because when the donors uh, uh, no funds the government start funding uh, because you know there is poverty the government itself has to do it but i am i am personally not uh, very, uh, uh, i i'm not happy with the ngo model because ngos are grant dependent and i think it is important to have a sustainable model so you can sustain whether the funding is coming or not you can continue working and 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 again uh you know i'm not proposing or 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 uh, uh, promoting a welfare state i would say we need to link two things separately i definitely would want the business houses to continue creating wealth uh and do business as usual but at the same time contribute to the csr funding and take up various initiatives and and help try and get uh, equity and equality as well um thank you very much sir uh so i would like to thank ashwajit sir and tanya ma'am for an enriching webinar uh, we are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experiences with us we appreciate having the lesser known area of the development sector clarified with such detail uh, we'll be sending a small token of appreciation at your residence from srcc family now i would like uh, reena ma'am to say a few words um Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ashwajit Singh and uh, Ms. Tanya, uh, Ms. Tanya Singh, for taking out your valuable time uh, to come and address our students. And also, it has also been a very learning experience for me to know the kind of work that 
you have been doing in the development sector development sector and it is laudable and i feel so proud to uh, to know that you, the alum and i of sst are doing such noble and worthy work and also i feel humbled looking at the expansive work that you are doing i uh, wish that you our interaction with it global continues and uh, you continue to uh, have this symbiotic relationship with us and take keep taking care of our students as you have done now thank you thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you for being there i'm uh, love to be back at srcc thank you thank you thank sir thank you ma'am thank you so much thanks a lot uh, guys there are poll uh, please uh, fill it up to request thank you once and all of thank you thank you thank you ma'am for staying through the session i know you are busy but thank you so much for being there thank you thank you so much sir and they could now have, have got a better principal at this time who herself is so passionate about the development sector certainly thank you the woman at the helm of affairs is the best thing shriram college could have uh, and so knowledgeable and a lady is commendable absolutely thank you so much all of you it was a pleasure thank you thank you thank you thank you very thank you much all for your time thank you, thank you. thank you thank you amir uh, thank you pranav uh, all right all right so um uh, placement cell and my gbo students and uh, srcc students uh, i want to compliment you uh, very well done amir pranav and the entire team and um, uh, um i think uh, my congratulations to the webinar cell to manu smriti uh, for designing and working behind the scenes and doing a great job i do thank you and i hope uh, we will have uh, more such in sessions which will enrich you as well so god bless you all and we uh, and i just want to say keep doing the good work excellent thank you hey, thanks brother thank you All right thank you everyone